Welcome to Recovery Equity, a series of conversations about how we can reach out and help more people find freedom from addiction. This is a space for us to reflect on some hard truths and to consider ways forward and even new possibilities. My name is Quinn No, and I'm a licensed clinical psychologist, but right now I primarily lead research at the Hazelden Betty Ford Foundation. Today, we are discussing the Asian American experience with focus on the stereotypes within the community and about the Asian American communities, the model minority effect, the heterogeneity of the community, and other important factors affecting Asian Americans and addiction. We're here today with Dr. Rochelle Concepcion, the current president of the Asian American Psychological Association and the clinical psychologist and behavioral health consultant with the Tripler Army Medical Center in Hawaii. Welcome Dr. Concepcion and thank you for being here with us and sharing your incredible expertise. Um, before we get started, uh, we would love to hear a little bit more about yourself and specifically about your experience um, professionally uh, with the Asian American community. Sure. Um, I've actually had a very multifaceted career. I started out doing a community mental health um, where I was fortunate to work with um, like diverse populations um, in the Los Angeles area. And then when I um, transitioned to uh, my um, postdoctoral career, I worked in a forensic state hospital um, for the state of California and um, was also exposed to like just diversity of issues, not just with um, ethnic and racial diversity, but with like socioeconomic backgrounds, um, as well as like just, you know, folks who have like migrated to California from like other, other states and other countries. Um, I ended up working for the military about 10 years ago and, you know, have fully embraced the experience because it also kind of opened up my eyes to, you know, working with, with folks of different backgrounds. And as we know, the military is becoming a lot more diverse in terms of the, um, the population. Uh, the service members are, um, you know, not just joining from, you know, the United States, but there are a lot of service members who are um, also immigrants. And it has been really interesting to, you know, work with them in terms of just um, how to overcome some of the stereotypes as well as like the stigma, you know, pertaining not just with the military, but then, you know, within their own cultures. And I think that opens up the door to um, some of the work that I've done with like Asian American um, and Native Hawaiian and even Pacific Islander populations where um, a really big part of the work has had to do with um, destigmatizing, um, seeking mental health, um, seeking mental health care, but then also um, kind of normalizing some of their experiences. So um, it's still a, wor a, a work in progress, but you know, especially in my role now at Triple Army Medical Center, I've been fortunate to work with um, military dependents, uh, retirees, and their spouses. And that population in and of itself is extremely diverse and, you know, still still working through some of the same issues of destigmatization de as well as um, some of the cultural variables that, you know, impact care. So, I, you know, I'm definitely proud of the work that I've done here and, you know, and I'm excited about, you know, continuing to work um, in this field. Thank you. So you mentioned stigma and stereotypes several times um, as you were talking. So in your experience, how do you think stereotypes within and about Asian Americans have impacted our understanding of addiction in Asian American and Pacific Islander communities, as well as like willingness to access care? As we know, within the Asian American, um, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander population, specific, specifically Asian Americans, um, there has been the stereotype of the model minority where, you know, like Asian Americans are, tend to be, you know, seen as like um, the ones that not, that don't make waves, the ones that are, that tend to be more um, easily adaptable to you know, some, some of the um, expectations and responsibilities thrust upon them. And when it comes down to, you know, seeking care, I think that that's one of the, the obstacles that tends to get in the way is like you don't make waves, you don't 
drive or you don't attract attention to yourself and you don't bring your yours or your family's issues you know to someone outside of the family dynamic or the community and so there is that barrier they don't want to see be seen as you know different as it is they're already seen as this like perpetual foreigner so you know to attract additional attention to oneself by you know seeking mental health care especially within the military it is already stigmatized that you know if you seek mental health um, treatment or um, substance use treatment you know you are seen as like broken or you know and some some folks tend to use the term like you know they're crazy um, they're defective and so that that kind of adds additional layers on top of already you know trying to endure like the the pressures of being like in the military yeah it sounds like the it's very um it sounds like a well in in the conversations i've had there's been this common thread among in particular communities of color um, the pressure in terms of how we represent, how we represent our families, how we represent um, our community members that really seems to make it hard to ask for help. Right, right. Like there is that concept of like saving face, right? You represent your family, you represent your community. And so, you know, if you go outside and seek care, it it brings down, you know, either the value of your family or it, um, you know, it just, it, like it almost um puts them in a place of like disrespect you know from 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 different opinions so yeah so it's hard enough to reach out and then can you say a little bit about the appropriateness of the care that's available then both in terms of the culture and sensitivity and then its impact on whether or not asian americans stay engaged in care as it is within the com- in, within the military community, there are very few um, providers who, um, I mean, when you think about like just medical providers, you know, and nursing staff, there there is a representation of like Asian Americans within those communities. But when you think about like providers who are, you know, sp- who specialize in like substance use treatment, psychiatry, you know, like so- psychology and social work, it's it's a population that's very underrepresented or it tends to be very underrepresented. So, you know, when it comes to providing more culturally competent care, representation matters. So if you don't see some of those faces in the clinics that you walk into, there's already that um, belief that no one's going to get what I'm what I'm what I'm talking about. And then on top of that, you um yeah, the immediate thing is like you won't you won't assume that the the provider sitting on the other cha- side of the chair from you is not understanding what you're going through. Right. So part of what um, I find really interesting about what you've said too is referencing the fact that um, there there aren't a lot of Asian Americans. Or, or, or individuals from a, from the AAPI community that go into these fields, that, that pursue these careers um, in mental health and addiction treatment. Um, can you uh, share a little bit about your perspective on that uh, in terms of our communities? Um, when we think about like some of our communities, going into a field such as like psychiatry, psychology, even like social work, it doesn't, it's not one of those like lucrative careers. You know, when we think about like medicine, it's usually something like family medicine or one of the other specializations like, you know, gastroenterology or something. Um, And then you kind of couple that with a field that's already kind of stigmatized in terms of you don't go to that field or you don't reach out to somebody of that discipline because, you know, it indicates that you're broken or there's something wrong with your family or something like that. So, you know, it's, it's, it's multifaceted when you think about like why, you know, there's an underrepresentation of like folks from the R community, you know, in those specific disciplines. I, I often um, share with, with my friends and colleagues that my parents still don't understand what I do. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's just, you know, it's not something that's really within, you know, their, their world understanding. Um, 
So we, we, it's, it's difficult even for me to have conversations with family members about what I do. So, um, right. yeah, it really reflects what you're talking about. Um, how do you think then to layer onto this, then how do you think the heterogeneity of the AAPI community then informs what we need to know about addiction and prevention and intervention and treatment for addiction in AAPI communities? I think it's really important, you know, as it is when we think about some of the data that's being, um, you know, accessed, you know, whether it be through like the CDC or other organizations that collect health um, disparity data. The unfortunate thing is like AAPI communities tend to be lumped together, you know, and you can't really capture what's happening, you know, when you think about all AAPI individuals or populations being lumped together. You know, there's not um, specific numbers when you think about like, okay, well, how does this affect the Filipino Filipino population, the South Asian population, who in and of itself is is very heterogene, um, heterogeneous, with you know, people identifying as Indian, Pakistani, you know, Bangladeshi, and um, you know, Nepalese. So you know, even with like East Asian populations, it's not just you know. East Asians, there's Koreans, Japanese, and Chinese, and within their cultures themselves, there are very specific um, belief systems, cultural practices that kind of inform, you know, what's actually going on within the community, like specific issues, family dynamics that could inform, like, what are the underlying reasons for you know, a particular mental health issue, a substance abuse issue or substance use issue. So it's really important to look at, you know, just some of those dynamics that are very specific to some of the communities and, you know, just be very mindful and sensitive to that when, you know, either we're reporting it or even when you're sitting down, you know, with a person who identifies as, you know, one of the Asian communities. Yeah. And, um, you you mentioned some of the statistics around it and and sort of my gut as a researcher and as a clinician has been that um, that I I believe there's a lot of underreporting um, of uh, substance use issues and substance use in general from Asian American communities, um, especially around sort of issues of social desirability. What are your thoughts on that? I agree. I agree. Because when we think about some of the some of the communities and and like, for example, alcohol use or even like, you know, nicotine use, it's so normalized within their communities and, you know, excessive amounts. Is, it doesn't account to something that's like pathological. They think of it as like, you know, it, it's the way that they cope or it's the it's it's, you know, it, it's a huge part of their culture to you know, drink during these times of the year or something like that. So, you know, there's a tendency to minimize when, you know, somebody starts to rely heavily on it as a way to, you know, cope better with things or, you know, to kind of numb themselves from some of the issues that are um, impacting them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, And then with the, the richness of your experience in the military, Can you also speak to, and you you mentioned this earlier, um, but can you speak to that intersection of AAPI identity in the military and then how that either, um, you know, helps or hinders issues with addiction and and treatment seeking among AAPI who are also in the military? When we think about, um, like, for example, a majority of the military population Um, comprises men, males. So when we think about stereotypes about Asian males, you know, there is a tendency uh, to believe that Asian males are, you know, less masculine than, you know, other other ethnicities. And when you think about help-seeking behavior, you know, it is one of those qualities that tends to be like um, less seen as less, less seen as masculinized. So, you know, that's one obstacle. Um, on the other spectrum, when we think about Asian females, Asian females tend to be fetishized. And um, you know, especially when we've thought about the, what's currently happening with the military and the number of 
reported sexual assaults and instances of sexual harassment, it kind of creates an additional burden, you know, for many Asian female like service members to seek help because, you know, there is a belief that they will be, um, you know, blamed as victims or their issues will be minimized because, you know, of how they identify. So a lot of those different things, you know, kind of um, intersect when we when we think about it. But those are just two examples. It could be a lot more when we when we think about just other cultural variables and, you know, just their specific communities that they identify with. Yeah, it it really um, it really speaks to the complexity, right? That that has to go into culturally responsive and and culturally sensitive um, treatment for AAPI communities um, when you layer in all of these different identities. So if you could, you know, send out like a big message to our communities out there, what would you want the AAPI communities to know about addiction and help seeking? I think the number one message um, that I'd want to send out is to let folks know that it is okay to seek out help and that it does not impact the concept of like saving face, right? If anything, it kind of reinforces that you want to be, you know, the strongest that you can be. I think that one of the biggest things that I often think about is like, you know, for the AAPI communities, especially for, you know, some of the like service members that are you know, serving and then also helping out their families, you know, that is an immense burden to be serving your country and then also, you know, do your best to help your family back home. And when we think about like the best analogy for that is you can't put on your oxygen or you have to put on your oxygen mask first before you can assist others. Like it's a, it's a very common analogy when we think about, you know, we are in these roles of you know, caregiving for our families, and yet we need to also be in um, caregiving roles for ourselves. Thank you. And then can you say a little bit about your experience as an AAPI provider, um, you know, and, and your experience, you know, providing care as an AAPI provider, um, and, you know, both in behavioral health, but also with addiction? and substance use? In my experience, it actually has been like really helpful to be like, um, I I guess that face, because a lot of the time when I have like AAPI patients, like, first of all, they're actually really surprised that, um, you know, like I am a person of color. And then it, it helps open up, you know, dialogues about, you know, just difficult things that they're coping with and even um, there's ease with being able to describe some of the cultural dynamics or the cultural impacts that are you know kind of um, influencing why you know they're coming in for assistance or you know why they're they're struggling with like substance use issues right and much of the time um I guess it's much easier to digest coming from somebody who looks like you and, you know, understands like where you came from or even, you know, understands your parents' immigrant stories or whatnot. So I think that that's been, um, you know, helpful for opening some of those doors. Um, As a matter of fact, I actually had a patient that spoke to me the other day and had told me that it was like refreshing to have like a female Asian provider who, um, you know, could understand where she was coming from, especially as a child of immigrants who had these these immense pressures to um, succeed, you know, hold down a lucrative job and, you know, have a family and, you know, just keep it all balanced when it was a really unrealistic expectation coming from, you know, her parents. So it's it's sometimes sometimes just even connecting on that level are just like the ways that you know, open up some of those doors and break down some of those walls that get in the way of their, their seeking help ultimately. Yeah, thank you. And, and I have to say that, um, you know, as, as a, a fellow mental health provider, it's really, um, it's really exciting for me to see another Asian American woman who is 
in the field and um, and doing the hard work. And I think it is an important message that um, that it, you and I can send to um, up and coming Asian Americans that this is a field that's very viable and that's um, really important for the healing of our communities too. So I thank you very much um, for your perspective and expertise today. No problem, no problem. And I think I forgot to add to at the beginning. I also serve. I'm. I'm. Um, I will be a psychologist in the Hawaii International Guard. I've served like for ten years as a public health officer, and I think also what's what's been really important in my role is that when you know younger members, especially younger AAPI members, see you know, an officer who, you know, looks like them, speaks like them, even like, you know, kind of knows, like, grew up with like immigrant parents and and kind of like struggled with that intergenerational gap. You know, it really makes a difference. You know, I've, I've heard a lot, you know, over the course of the past several months that representation matters. And when you're in that, in, in that position, and, you know, when you're a younger person and you see somebody in that position, it makes a huge difference in terms of being able to seek care or, you know, just being able to be vulnerable with other people about some of your experiences in the hopes that they can be inspired as well to um, <clears throat> seek some of that help. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, I, I thank you so much um, for both the work that you do in behavioral health for our communities, as well as the service um, that you have given uh, to our country. So um, on behalf of everyone watching or listening, I want to express my gratitude for you taking the time um, today to speak with us. And um, you've given us a lot to think about. Um, so to everyone out there, please let your friends and colleagues know about these conversations and come back often to catch more episodes of Recovery Equity. Together, we can build a healthier, happier, and more equitable tomorrow. Thank you.